Hey, what's up everyone? It's Jeremy Steiner, and we have now reached the texturing process of the sci-fi weapon for VR series. Wow, I'm, I'm so excited we're here because as a texture and material artist, this is the part that I've been waiting for. So if you're new around here, what this is, is I've created a, a small series of videos where in creating a sci-fi weapon that's gonna be used in VR games, I've been sort of documenting the process in a way from beginning to end on what's involved in creating a, a game asset like this, but also explaining kind of the, the things that I'm learning. So, so one of the things that I really love about texturing is that texturing is storytelling in that the materials that something is made out of or the wear and tear and how rough the thing is or the colors or the overall design it's all shaped by the texturing of the asset you take the momentum from that concept sketch through the modeling and now finally through to texturing i found it really difficult to approach this video originally i was going to open up Substance Painter and record the entire process and explain what I was doing as I was doing it. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show it to you now. All right, so you've seen it. You've seen this first pass at texturing the sci-fi weapon for VR. And now, instead of just going through, like I said, the whole process of how I did it, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I've learned. Because the main reason for doing this portfolio piece was to learn, push the boundaries of what I knew, of what I could do in Unreal Engine, what I could do to create a low resolution game object that still has more details. We talked about in the baking video. And I can definitely tell you, when working with these different engines, I have learned quite a bit. So let's talk about those now. First of all, metals in Unreal Engine 4 work completely differently. Completely differently? Metals in Unreal Engine work very differently than how they react, say reflection wise, in path tracers that I'm used to using like Redshift, Octane, V-Ray. There's a lot of tricks that it has to pull in order to make it look realistic and, you know, working with different lighting sources and reflection captures. Oh my gosh, it was... It was quite a learning experience, and I'm really glad that I've gone through it now. The most important thing that I could say is build for the engine that you're going to be using it in. So just because it looks good in iRay and Substance Painter does not mean it's going to look anything like that in-game or in-engine. So periodically going through, saving those maps, putting them into Unreal Engine and testing it out. That's basically what I did throughout the whole process. I need to make sure. And eventually I started to get a feel for, okay, if I make something this rough in Substance Painter, then I can definitely see that it's gonna look this rough in Unreal Engine. A big thing that I had to learn personally when importing maps into Unreal Engine is to make sure that some of them are being interpreted so that they are raw, specifically the normal map or the reflection or uh, roughness maps. Anything that was really information and not so much color information like, like data from black to white or normal information has to be interpreted raw. Otherwise, you're gonna get a really weird gamma adjustment, especially when it comes to roughness and, and metalness. Um, I was getting all kinds of weird results until fixing that up. All you have to do is click the checkbox in the image file there to make sure that it's not being interpreted as sRGB. You're good to go. Okay, before we get to more lessons, let's go through the Substance Painter file and I can just quickly walk you through what I've done layer by layer. Okay, so here we are in Substance Painter and I've loaded in the low poly mesh with the baked mesh maps. So you can see over here in my project section here in my shelf. I've got some baked mesh maps here. I did, however, have to bake a couple extra ones. So what I ended up doing was going to my texture set settings, scrolling down to mesh maps, and then bake mesh maps. So you see we already have our ID map that we have in here, but I've also got something like thickness and world space and position. So in addition to baking things out in Marmoset like we did in the previous videos, we can also bake some mesh maps right in Substance Painter. And because Substance Painter has these really fast GPU bakers, it didn't take very long at all to do. I mainly needed these extra maps here so that I could use these smart filters and smart masks, which I'll show in a second. So I'll go switch back to layers here. And so now we have the weapon here in its glory. 
So the first thing I wanted to show is those two materials that we made in that tutorial. If you haven't seen that, I'll link it up in the top here or down in the description below. But I made a tutorial on how to create some cool painted metals materials in Substance Designer with some damage and procedural edge wear. Pretty cool. Highly recommend you check it out. So you can see what it looks like on the weapon here. I'm just going to enable the coarse metal. And let's check it out here. We've got a little bit of damage here. You can see under this coarse folder that I have, we've got a couple layers here and we've got some masks. And these masks have what's called the metal edge wear filter on them. So I can click on this and go into mask view. And you can see it's created this really nice procedural edge wear based on the maps that we just baked. So right away that gives me a leg up on quickly seeing some damage. And so I've applied this and you can see I've set the scale. The really important thing here is in this layer, I had to change the scale quite a bit. I've put up all the way to 40 here to get it to tile nicely. But you can see we've got that nice small bump texture here. And I've applied it to a few parts of the mesh. Now, how did I quickly apply this to the mesh? Well, let me show you. The reason why we baked out this ID map makes things so simple to target particular pieces in Substance Painter. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to disable this and hide this. I'm going to make a new layer here. Let's go and create a new fill layer. And I'm just going to drag this above my base for now. So we've got this new fill layer. What I want to do is I want to target the color and let's just say the roughness for now. So what I can do is I can alt click on color and that just deselects all the other ones. And then I can select roughness here. Let's make it really shiny. And then I'm just gonna select a, let's go with a blue color here. That's fine. So you see it applies it to the whole object and that's not what I'm looking for. So what I can do is I can target certain parts of my mesh. Now, Substance Painter was just recently updated with a really cool feature which allows you to target specific pieces of your mesh based on the different object names and mesh names in the OBJ or FBX file that you're using. And I'll show that really quickly by going to this button here and this is the square here. You can select all of these pieces and that is extremely useful and removes the need for something like an ID map. But I'll show you what I did before, before this update came out. So I'm just going to click back over here to get out of that mode. And so what I did was I right clicked on my layer, added a black mask here. And so you see now it's disappeared from here. I can paint on this mask and just apply what's going on in my layer. Or what I could do is I could right click on the fill layer and add color selection. So what I can do here is choose pick color and this brings up my ID mask. And so let's say I want to make, I don't know, let's go with this back piece here. So I click this back piece and now it's the only part of the mesh that has this new layer being applied to it. Now, what you can do is you can adjust the hardness and tolerance of the ID mask here. And you could say, well, I want everything that I'm targeting with this color selection to be black instead of white. So you can exclude things this way as well. So that's why the ID mask is really useful. And I can go around and I can pick another color. Let's say I want this to be blue, pick another color and I want this to be blue. And you can see now it's that easy. And here are the colors that you have. You can exclude one, say I don't want that piece. And now it's just like that. So I did that with these two base materials that we created in Substance Designer, the coarse and the smooth, and applied it to different sections of our mesh. And you can see it's not too bad. It has a little bit of edge wear. You can see the roughness is doing pretty well. Although I will have to say I did need to adjust the roughness a little bit by going and creating, if I right click here and add a levels, I added a couple levels here that targeted different channels. So this levels is, is targeting the roughness. You can see if I adjust this here, if you look over here, it's changing the roughness values. And so I did need to fix up the roughness just a little bit to get it looking the way I wanted. And so that's the base of it. And so, yeah, that was the idea for those, those two materials that I made, just to add some sort of base to start painting over and add some neat detail. After that, I've got this plastic here. And I decided that I didn't want some of these, I didn't want the weapon to be a full metal, be really heavy. And as I was going through the kind of story that I wanted to tell with this weapon, I decided that it was gonna be more manufactured 
and less of a prototype. So plastic started to come to mind. So now you can see I've got this really cool shiny plastic on the back piece here. Also a plastic here and on the front. And it's great. This is just a smart material that came from Substance Painter. So if I go to, let's go to all here and I'll search for plastic. There's a ton of these great materials that come with Substance Painter and you can just pick one here. This might be it. And just drag that into your layer stack. Next up, one of the parts that really define this weapon are these pipes. And so I decided to go with a copper smart material here and really make it seem like it's got that older kind of classic aesthetic to it. It's quite shiny right now, but you can see I've added some around the lens pieces here at the top and where all these pipes are as well as the back of this deflector piece as well. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go with copper or silver, so I left a silver variant here, but I think I decided to go with copper. And continuing on with the pipes here, I've now added some damage onto it. And really mostly what that is, is just having a layer here with a little bit of roughness applied and then painting on a black mask here with a paint layer. I can toggle that mask on and you can see I've just gone on with a brush. I, for this particular project, chose, if I go to brushes, this artistic heavy sponge. And, and that added some really nice, almost fingerprinty smudge-like effects to this mask. And then if I go back to the material, you can see it's adding some really nice roughness and wear to these pipes. So I'm going to skip over engravings for a second here, and I'm going to go straight to sci-fi detail. This is sort of where I wanted to push the bounds of what kind of extra details I wanted to add onto the mesh without modeling them in originally to the actual geometry. So I'm just going to enable these sci-fi detail layers here, and you can start to see some of these extra components coming in. You've got these vents here. I'll just toggle this on and off again. We've got things like little holes here to show that it's being manufactured and snapped together here. Same with these kind of divots. We've also got on the top of the weapon, we've got this kind of thing going on to show that you can snap these and put them into different places to focus them. These kind of ringlets around the eyepieces as well. Stuff underneath the weapon as well. A bit difficult to see. You've got stuff like that here and in the back as well, adding these lines and sort of vent marks, just adding a smaller touch of detail to the weapon. I can just toggle these on and off again. I'm going to go now to the lenses. So you can see they are, they're not very transparent right now, so if I go to lenses here and enable that you can see we get some transparency here as well as some lens damage that I'm going to add on here and so that's possible by going to your texture set settings and making sure well a couple of things actually you want to make sure that if you go to the shader settings and you choose the shader that has PBR metal rough with alpha blending and that gives you the option to add a channel here when I did that now if I go to my lenses, I now have this opacity material channel. So in this case, I took a levels and altered the opacity this way by affecting that opacity channel, and then also added some damage here that went onto the lenses. And you get this neat translucent, but with a little bit of like a fog or some smudging. It looks great. So then the process became just adding more wear and tear and scratches. So I'm just going to put on some grunge, the dirt, some procedural dirt and some fingerprints here. And you can see that the materials now have filled out quite a bit. You've got lots of interesting dirt here where like if someone's gonna place their thumb around here or they're gonna you know, move the safety switch or something like that, it's gonna leave this kind of wear and dirt to this kind of metal. And again, I can toggle that on and off. And it was cool just trying to figure out you know where you know where it's going to become used and scratched all these extra indents so if you go here you can see we've got these nice scratches here and they're not just color changes they're also 
affected into the height or normal. So if I go into that scratches layer, you can see that the height is a little bit indented with a little bit of a negative number here. And I can bring that down and you can see it's accented. So I'll show you a quick time lapse here of me creating this status panel on the side of the weapon. And I was thinking it'd be really cool to do that. But once I decided to add it, I really thought it kind of destroys the aesthetic of this classical looking piece in a way, you know, where it's made out of old materials that have this sort of sci-fi futuristic look to it. So I'll just enable it here. And you can see it kind of just, it looks neat, but it doesn't necessarily flow with the vibe of this weapon. So it's nice. It's got just like you have the opacity channel. It has an emissive channel, which you can add to your texture set settings by going in here and adding the plus button for emission. But in the end, like I said, I decided not to go with that status panel. There's one more thing missing that I wanted to show you, and that is these grips that I decided to add onto the handles of the weapon. So let's go back to the grips and let's enable them. I really enjoy the process of making these because this is what, you know, this is what really excites me about Substance Painter, how you can easily paint on these grips and really cool materials all at once. And I'm gonna show you exactly how I did that now. So I'm just gonna disable my grip layers and I'm gonna create a new folder here. And let's just put it above all these other ones and hide that. I'm gonna call this grip example. Now I need to figure out what I want the basic material of my grip to be. So I'm going to go in, go to my materials. Okay, so I've got this plastic grainy material that I found here. I'm gonna drag that into my grip example. And you can see it comes in a really weird scale. So I'm just gonna go down and scale this up to a nice 9.55, that's fine. And what I'm gonna do is right click it and add a black mask. And so I'm just gonna paint a little bit over here just so I can see what I'm doing. I want to add a lip around where I apply this grip so that we get uh, a good transition from one material to the next. So it's actually really cool how you can do this in Substance Painter by using something called anchor points. So what I'll do is I'll right click on the mask here and add an anchor point. So what I can do is everything that happens in this layer from this point can be transferred and applied to other layers. For instance, what I can do is in this folder that I have, I can add a fill layer. And let's just pop it into the right place, add a black mask. And then inside this black mask, I'm gonna add a fill layer and say, under this grayscale channel, go to anchor points and I'm gonna find that plastic grainy mask that we used. Great, so I'm gonna click that and now, where this white fill layer is, it's referencing that mask that we painted before and it's applying that effect. So instead of targeting all these channels, I'm gonna turn everything off except for height. So I'm gonna choose, uh, I'm gonna hold the Alt key, click height, and I'm just gonna adjust the height a little bit. Let's just keep it sticking out just a little bit. And then what I'll do is I'll go to that mask, right click, add a filter, and the filter I'm going to add is blur. And I'm just going to increase the intensity a little bit. Just a little. Then what I can do, right click the mask, add a levels. And let's target in on that outline here. So if I pull this over, you can see we can really refine the lip of where we've painted. I can adjust these. Let's do something like that for now. And so because we have this blur here, I can increase the blur and that increases the outline, but I don't want it to go too far. Great, let's adjust these levels a little more. Maybe I can change, okay. So now here's the really cool part. If I go back to this mask that we've made and what I'll do is I'll hit X and just remove everything we've done. Just paint over with black. So now if I hit X again, if I just paint on my mesh, I can now paint where I want this grip to go. And it updates in real time. With all of my effects in place. And then I can go back here. So I'm just painting half the grip. 
I can go back and take a look around and say, you know what, that lip is too strong. So I'll go to my levels and adjust where and how sharp that edge is. And you can just do that for the entire grip, which is exactly what I did. So I'll just remove this layer here and enable my front and back grips. You can just paint one on. So anchor points are absolutely amazing. And so that's pretty much the texturing process of this weapon. I think the reason why it took so long for me was mainly because I just wanted to decide what I wanted to do and figure out how I could push the sci-fi elements here with adding in those normal decals and different shapes in where to put it and just decide what I wanted to do with the weapon. Now this is definitely one pass at this weapon. I think there's many different ways to go about it. So in the future, I might make some different skins, which would be kind of fun. Throw in some different colors, maybe make a brand new shiny one or make a really old rusty one. Sky's the limit in this case. So that's one version of the textured weapon. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I might, I might make a couple other skins. There's plenty of other things I could do. I could go in a completely different direction and add like stickers and make it either, maybe a very clean right off the production line version or a more sci-fi and luminescent version. Who knows? The point is I can do anything I want with it and that's the power of Substance Painter. I definitely took notice that you really wanna keep maybe 80, of your texturing procedural first and then really push that extra 20% with the hand painted texturing whether it's mainly for like rust or dirt or wear and tear something that isn't you know symmetrical and adding that extra flair really pushes that end result to make it look like a realistic asset also I find it really fun to create tools so one of the things I really wanted to play around with was creating you know, these sci-fi decal inlets in Substance Designer and then pushing that into Substance Painter. A lot of those hard surface normals that you can drag onto a brush in Substance Painter are Substance files that you can just adjust and change the width and length and height of those cuts and inlets, which is really cool. So I might look into making a bunch of those. I guess because I'm just now starting to fill out my portfolio, I'm noticing something a lot that I found other artists are saying that portfolio pieces and personal works are never finished. You know, they're they're always going to have another thing that you can do to them and you just have to draw the line at some point, don't you? So because I have a couple more projects that I really want to get going and I want to make a bunch more videos, I decided I'm going to draw the line here and just finish the texturing of the weapon as it is right now. So. There's one more video in this series, one last thing we gotta do, and that is trying the weapon in VR, creating some really cool particle effects, firing it off, and displaying it in a really simple but fun environment that I've created in Unreal Engine, and that is gonna be in the next video. So, if you like this video and you wanna learn more about texturing, hit the thumbs up, it lets me know that you're watching, and hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos because there's a ton of more content coming, especially when it comes to substance designer tutorials. I've got a really fun one coming up really soon. So thank you all so much for watching. I'm Jeremy Siner, and I'll see you in the next video.